I'm Dennis Hayes. I was the national coordinator of the first Earth Day back in 1970 and the founder of the Earth Day Network, which then took it international. Uh, thank you for turning into Earth Day Live, our digital version, and our special section on the State of the Earth Report from USA Facts. I'm just delighted to be joined here today by the founder of USA Facts and the former CEO of Microsoft, Steve Ballmer. Let me briefly discuss the history of Earth Day and the role of hard science and undisputed facts in the creation of the modern environmental movement. Then we'll transition to Steve to talk about USA Facts and describe its new report on the state of the Earth. In the 1960s, Americans became aware of the increasing prosperity as a measure of GDP was becoming increasingly divorced from our sense of well-being. And this perception was rooted in developments in hard science. Ari Hagen-Schmidt at Caltech firmly linked automobile exhaust to photochemical smog. Rachel Carson beautifully summarized the scientific literature linking pesticides to plummeting bird populations, including the threatened extinction of our national symbol, the bald eagle, as well as the California condor. Out of all of that came a really broad national consensus. That, that first Earth Day involved 20 million people, roughly one out of every, yeah, well, it would have been, yeah, one out of every 10 Americans participating in that first Earth Day. And it led to a series of bipartisan supports of really sweeping environmental legislation. In fact, the first big achievement, the Clean Air Act of 1970, was not just bipartisan, but it was essentially unanimous. It passed on a voice vote in the US Senate and with one dissent in the House of Representatives. And then moved on to the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the National Environmental Education Act, National Forest Protection Act, and uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and just on and on and on, with sweeping support across Congress. And the Republican president of the United States, Richard Nixon, set up the EPA with an executive order and appointed Republican Bill Ruckelshaus, who on his own initiative banned lead in gasoline, banned lead in paint, and banned DDT. But the lead in paint turned out to be a, a very important early foray in environmental justice because poor children were peeling paint off of walls that had lead in it and it had a sweetish taste but that lead was uh, adversely affecting their brains and their central nervous systems. The bipartisan nature of this has not always been the case, partly as a result of Nixon's Southern strategy that flipped the very conservative, solidly democratic South to the Republican party. And then in the era of James Watt and Dick Cheney, anti-environmentalism came somewhat to the fore. But we still occasionally find bipartisan support, especially for things like solar energy and intelligent diets within segments even of the Tea Party. Wherever we have found people who respect science and will pay attention to technological progress. The theory behind USA Facts is pretty straightforward. The United States government collects and publishes a lot of data, but much of it just gathers dust on shelves. For one reason or another, it seems inaccessible to the public. USA Facts gathers that information and presents it in a format that makes it really easy to comprehend. We at the Earth Day Network were delighted to partner with USA Facts on the release of what I think might be its first compilation that goes outside the American border to provide a, a rich trove of information on the state of the earth. And to discuss that, let me turn the stage over to my neighbor up here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, Steve Ballmer. Thanks, Dennis, very much. It's an honor to have gotten to know you through this process. Uh, the founding of Earth Day and all the impact it has had on society is really quite amazing. Uh, you really nailed uh, the mission of USA Facts. Uh, we started uh, four years ago when I was really trying to understand our government where does it raise its money? Where does it spend it? And what kind of outcomes does it get for society? I was looking for something that was a, as objective, comprehensive, and comprehensible as the kinds of reports that businesses are required to publish about their businesses. 
I didn't find that kind of integrated view across state, federal, and local government. And that's what led us to start USA Facts. We've covered the broad constitutional mission of our country from, if you will, establishing justice to uh, promoting uh, the general welfare of our citizens. But this is the first time we've pulled that information together simply focused in here on the, on the earth, which has been an exciting process for us. Again, only government numbers, completely nonpartisan, and even we won't take a point of view on issues of, of science. We all have our personal views, but we know there are people across the spectrum. But every debate around this topic needs to be grounded in the data, the data that our government collects. If you go to our site, usafacts.org, you can see what this unique presentation looks like. As we run here through the site, you can get something of sense of what we're up to. You scroll down, you'll see information that comes from the Energy Information Administration, from NOAA, that focuses in on topics of energy and admissions, environment and climate, uh, air quality, we even have dived into what government really does to support in the efforts to manage and take good care of our environment. How much does government spend? What does government spend that money on? As we looked through the government information, there was a lot uh, that was interesting, uh, certainly to me, who's not an expert in this topic. But even for the experts, we provide a rich database from over eight different government sources that pulls that information together in a comprehensive and comprehensible way. For me personally, I'll just throw some things out. On 2017, the US ranked fifth among the world's 10 largest economies for the proportion of energy coming from renewals and renewables and nuclear. Now, some people say, why do you mix those two? because the data that comes from our government that compares across country, and we do have some government data from the Energy Information Administration that does the comparison, it puts together renewable and nuclear. Uh, I was surprised that the United States rated as high as it did at 19%, although we're well behind France, which uh, we know uses quite a bit of nuclear, and behind Brazil, which uses quite a bit of hydroelectric. Uh, I also learned that Washington State uses the most renewables, where I live, uh, of any state in the country, thanks to the plentiful hydroelectric uh, sources in, in our state. This one also kind of got me. The US is, emits uh, the second most amount of carbon dioxide uh, in the world, total emitter. But if you look at the carbon dioxide emitted per person, uh, the United States has actually improved since uh, 1990. If you look here, you can see the increase in China, the increase in India, the dramatic increase in South Korea and Saudi Arabia. The United States has actually gone the other direction, gray to red, gray being 1990, red being what we see in 2017. Uh, I think we can feel good about the improvements, uh, if you will, and uh, those will certainly find the total uh, still striking. Uh, and no matter where people fall on these issues, I think this provides an important uh, perspective and certainly one uh, that surprised me to, to no small extent. I'll give you another one that uh, was also interesting to me we looked at average annual precipitation across the country. Now this information comes, for example, from NOAA, the National o Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And we took a look at changes in precipitation uh, versus uh, 1895 to 2019. The last piece of data we looked, le looked at on carbon dioxide emissions was from 2017, because unfortunately our government doesn't stay current. But here for precipitation, you can see the numbers. California's had an average drop of three uh, inches in precipitation per year since 1895. So we're getting drier in the states in gray 
and we're getting wetter in the states in dark blue. I might have thought there was more consistency across the country and how these numbers have moved. Um, I know nothing about weather, but I, I was surprised to see South Carolina in a class with California and Oregon uh, and Maine to be, to be so much wetter. Now you could say individually, are any of these surprises all that important? Maybe, maybe not. But what we're trying to do is educate people again with comprehensive information. And I just picked a few to uh, show you what has been interesting to me. We took a look at air quality. Air quality, I think, is a, a very important thing. I spend my time between Seattle and Los Angeles. There's certainly a difference in air quality between the two places. But the question from my mind is, what's happened over time with some of these numbers? So here's the information going back to 1980 all the way through to, to the present uh, on air quality. The dark blue line you see is the average of all places in the United States. But if you take a look in the animation here at some specific data from specific places, you can see as these lines start to change what things look like in various states. You can take a look at what these numbers look like adjusted by population. Uh, which, is, which is important. You can take a look at regions of the country, where's the south been, or even metro areas. This is Los Angeles, which you can see started off the charts, if you will, and it's come down to almost the average in the country. Last, I show you Portland, Oregon, uh, which is pretty close to the average, which surprised me, given it's in the, the northwest and right on the coast, where at least I guessed we might have quite a bit better uh, air quality. So there's a number of dimensions in here which have surprised me. Certainly one of the things that was most important to check in on is how much money does our government actually spend on environmental and natural resources issues. In 2019, our federal government spent 37.9 billion, but it's only 8% of all federal expenditures. Big number, small number, well, that'll be in the eye of the beholder, but the numbers speak for themselves. If you look at what's happened in spending across a variety of different government departments, again, pink reflects today, gray reflects where we were in 1980, the single biggest thing we spend money on today is civil works, building, structures, et cetera, in this area. The biggest decrease was in money that the federal government transfers to state and local governments for their spending needs and purposes. Interestingly, if you take a look at the spend that comes from state and local government, state and local government spends about 66 billion on the environment, but over half of that gets spent on parks and recreation. There's a lot in here. There's a lot to take a look at. That there's a lot that may grab you individually. One of the things I really encourage people to do across everything in government is to look at things comprehensively. It's easy to think, for example, 37.9 billion is a big number. It's easy to think it's a small number in the context of total federal spend. It's important to be able to look at things longitudinally and to look at all of the issues at the same time to decide how you think about the priorities for our country. Again, I appreciate the partnership uh, with the Earth Day group. Dennis, I appreciate your time today and we'll look forward to continuing to provide a comprehensive view of government data as it relates to the Earth and our environment. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve.